thinking further about puzzles in modern and contemporary art and material culture to Sherry Irvin. And it's, again, I have, I have a written bio here, but I'm not going to ignore it entirely because Sherry is Associate Dean of the Graduate College and Presidential Research Professor of Philosophy and Women's and Gender Studies at the University of Oklahoma. Um, Sherry first came to my conscious notice because she has the best choice of shoes. She just <laughs> wears terrific shoes. And for the, the many years that we've known each other. Like <laughs> I thought this, this, is, this is qualification enough to be a great aesthetician. <laughs> However, she's done, a few, she's done many other things as well. She's the author of Immaterial, A Philosophy of Contemporary Art, which is under contract with OUP. Is that that's coming to its conclusion? Yeah. I have submitted the full manuscript. Great. <laughs> so. And editor of the volume Body Aesthetics from 2016. And she's served on all kinds of journal boards and done all kinds of really fascinating, useful um, and uh, work in the field of aesthetics and, uh, and ethics as well. So Sherry is uh, going to talk to us about the expressive import of, oh, it's up there, good, the expressive import of degradation and decay in contemporary art. Sherry Irvin. Well, I'm really delighted to have been included um, in this workshop because um, there are really few things that I enjoy more than getting into a room with a bunch of conservators and curators um, in thinking about, um, about art. And specifically, I tend to think about contemporary art. Um, really, a lot of what I've been writing about for the last several years is closer to the kinds of things that Jeff Free and Francesca talked about today in terms of communicate, you know, like the, the constitution of the artwork through communicative acts, works that haven't been fabricated or are subject to refabrication and variable display. But today I'm gonna to shift gears and talking about sort of the nature of the materials themselves when artists are using very unconventional materials from a sort of traditional artistic standpoint and thinking from a sort of philosophical perspective about what are our options for identifying identifying the way in which those materials contribute to the meaning and the expressive import of the work. I'd say traditional philosophical discussions have given us somewhat limited options for acknowledging how the materials out of which something um, is constituted contribute to its meaning. And I'm trying to see, given what philosophers have offered to us, how can we bring that into an account of where the meaning comes from. So I sort of think of new media artists playing in the fourth dimension by creating works that are extended into time, you know, video works, interactive, uh, digital works, that kind of thing. But a lot of object-based artists are playing in the fourth dimension by creating works that are designated for degradation or decay. Um, because after all, decay is one of the most fruitful processes of continual evolution that you can set in place for an object-based work without requiring that there be a bunch of ongoing maintenance. And so today I want to think about the expressive import of this tendency to create works that are destined for or that kind of carry implications of delight lapidation or collapse. Um, so I'm going to talk about the philosophical concept of exemplification and um, its implication that actual decay and not just depicted decay or simulated decay might have particular expressive power. So there's a reason for making objects that really are going to decay instead of just making like a vanitas or something like that. And second, I'll suggest that this expressive power is due to the distinctive bodily and emotional effects that decaying materials and structures have on us. And I hope that point will sort of seem too, it may seem rather obvious from a sort of pre-theoretical perspective, and yet philosophers often haven't been great at acknowledging that um, bodily response can actually be sort of a source of meaning, because we tend to do this very cognitive thing about, about meaning often in our discipline. So um, let's see. Nelson Goodman and Catherine Elgin discuss exemplification, which is the phenomenon whereby a work both possesses and refers back to one or more of its own properties. So Goodman gives the example of a tailor's swatch. The swatch possesses many properties. It is of a certain shape and a certain size, but insofar as it is functioning as a swatch, a sample of fabric, 
it exemplifies only the properties of the fabric whose nature it is designed to show us. So it exemplifies the fabric's color and texture. It doesn't exemplify its own shape and size. Those are kind of incidental, right? Catherine Elgin elaborates the idea of an object referring to some of its own properties. She says, to highlight underscore, display, or convey involves reference as well as instantiation of a property. An item that at once refers to and instantiates a feature may be said to exemplify that feature. So it's like you both have the feature and you're like, feature, <laughs> pointing to the feature. Exemplification, Elgin suggests, is a matter of presenting features in a context contri contrived to render them salient. And Goodman suggests that expression is a central aesthetic function of exemplification. He says not all exemplification is expression, but all expression is exemplification. It's a very strong claim. I don't know if we should accept it, but certainly I place it here not so much to endorse it, but to suggest that certainly he thinks exemplification is really key to how a work can express anything at all. Um, so there's a this famous example of Zoe Leonard's um, Strange Fruit for David, which I'll talk about some today. It's one of the examples that I'll focus on a bit. And it exemplifies the property of being made from real fruit peels. This property is not merely possessed by the work, but is highly salient in an art context where obviously the inclusion of unstable organic materials is not only historically, I mean, <laughs> organic materials that are unstable to this extent, um, is historically uncommon and also poses a notorious challenge from a conservation standpoint. Um, so the work also exemplifies the property of being in a state of decay. And as we'll see, that was very much a conscious choice that, um, that Zoe Leonard made even after it was um, brought into the collection of the Phil Philadelphia Museum of Art. So the question is, how does, so, you know, Goodman is saying that, um, that expression involves exemplification and how does exemplification have expressive power? One part of the answer lies in a distinction between literal exemplification, like these, this work literally exemplifies being made of decaying fruit, and metaphorical exemplification. So when a work literally exemplifies a certain property, this may make it especially apt to metaphorically exemplify further properties in a way that we experience as expressive. So Goodman says, a picture literally possesses a gray color, really belongs to the class of gray things but only metaphorically does it possess sadness or belong to the class of things that feel sad. And Elgin offers a number of examples. An experiment can metaphorically exemplify powers like pa properties like power, elegance, panache, and promise. A painting, properties like electricity, balance, movement, and depth, right? A painting doesn't literally exemplify movement um, in most instances, but it can metaphorically exemplify that through its actual properties. Narrative or representational works can metaphorically exemplify by way of representation or depiction. She says, the figure in Guernica on the left um, metaphorically exemplifies grief, right? I mean, it's just a surface with marks on it. There's no literal exemplification of grief here, but there is the properties that are in fact exemplified, called to mind by the work, metaphorically exemplify grief. So I want to suggest in a way that they did not discuss that literal exemplification of included materials can serve as a vehicle for and heighten metaphorical exemplification. So strange fruit for David literally exemplifies the property of ma being made of fruit in a way that is central to its content. So if you don't know the about this work, Leonard was grieving the death from AIDS of her friend and fellow artist, David Wojnarowicz, and she began gathering the peels of fruits that she and other friends had eaten. And she used needle and thread to sew the pieces of peel back together. And she left the stitching very visible, as you can see. And on some of the peels, she added embellishments like zippers and buttons. And then to display the work, the reconstituted and decorated fruit peels are spread out in a seemingly random array um, on the floor. Now, you can get fruit-related content um, through mechanisms other than exemplifying fruit, directly including it in the work, right? The work alludes, through both its materials and its title, to the song Strange Fruit, which was written by Abel Mirapol and first recorded by Billie Holiday, which poignantly deplores lynching and other forms of racism. And it also alludes to the use of the word fruit as a pejorative term for gay men. It evokes theistic notions of the Garden of Eden and the fall, whereby humans lost their privileged status through a choice to consume the forbidden fruit, 
often used as a metaphor for socially or religiously stigmatized sexual activity and were condemned to earthly suffering. So this complex of illusions invites us to contemplate the role of societal oppression in the AIDS epidemic, which was certainly very much in play. This, she was making this work in the, in the early 90s um, when uh, a failure to respond effectively to the AIDS epidemic was a major issue. Now, Leonard could have secured these allusions to all of this content by making a painting that depicts decaying fruit. But the choice to make the word work out of actual fruit peels allows her to secure the elusive content in a direct and powerful way. It also allows her work to literally exemplify the work's degradation, which she understands is crucial to its meaning. So when the work was acquired by the Philadelphia Museum of Art, she initially explored aggressive conservation measures with the well-known conservator Christian Scheidemann. This is a pretty familiar example. But as um, curator Ann Temkin wrote, um, Leonard surprised herself and found that she recoiled at Scheidemann's hard-won results. She realized that the appearance of decay was not enough for her. The metaphor of disappearance was insufficient. The mere pretense of deterioration was no longer persuasive. She set herself a criterion of honesty and rejected the 25 preserved pieces. She decided that it was essential to the work's expressive power that it directly embody deterioration rather than, rather than only alluding to it. These acts have different communicative significance. But I was, um, you know, I've been thinking about this and thinking about whether, does, does the concept of exemplification really explain anything, right? I mean, okay, they, she's, what she's exemplifying is actual fruit instead of exemplifying a depiction of fruit. But why is it that that's more effective at getting us to the content that she's alluding to? Why is it that that's more effective at, at securing the metaphor? And I was kind of giving a talk about this last week in Mexico City, and I was sort of thinking about that and feeling dissatisfied with the account that I was giving. And so here's sort of the next iteration of thinking about why, what is the real explanation there? It seems like we need a psychological explanation that goes beyond just saying, oh, this property is present and it's also pointed to and therefore like that just doesn't seem very satisfying. So why does the actual presence of a material or property in the work have power that a depiction or simulation does not? Um, if Leonard's decaying fruit peels are deployed in the service of a metaphor, why couldn't that metaphor be activated just as effectively by something like a painting, like a vanitas, right? So the special powers of the fabric swatch. Now, so the special powers of the fabric swatch are epistemic. Right? The swatch shows us in detail what the fabric is life, like. So it is important to have the actual fabric there and not just have a picture of it because it's telling us something about what the fabric is like. The weave, the drape, the transparency, the feel on the skin. But Zoe Leonard isn't including fruit peels to show us what fruit peels are like. Like That's not really the point there. The power is expressive, not epistemic. And this seems to require some further explanation. So to answer this, I'd like to bring together some reflections by Suzanne Langer from the middle of the 20th century. Langer suggested that we tend to understand a space as organized by our kinetic possibilities within it. Like if we think about the space that we're in right now, we've got some paths that we can get through. And especially as those of you back there are probably acutely aware, you've got some paths that are not really open to you that are kind of closed off. And there's all this, also all this space up here, but we tend not to think as much about that because we can't, you know, you just can't hovercraft into that space right now. That's not an option for us. So Langer says further, when a sculpture is present in our space, we tend to understand the space as organized by the kinetic possibilities that we imagine for that sculptural object, even if we know perfectly well that it's not actually going to move. And that changes how we experience the space. Once we're thinking of the space as organized by the kinetic possibilities for this sculptural object, that shifts our experience too. She describes sculpture as virtual kinetic volume. She thinks those kinetic potentialities that we imagine are actually really key to experience of the sculpture. And she, she suggests that the sculpture's implied kinetic nature tends to activate a connection between vision and touch. So she says, the intimate relationship between touch and sight, which is thus affected by the semblance of kinetic volume, explains some of the complex sensory reactions which sculptors, as well as laymen, often have toward it. Many people feel a strong desire to handle every figure. Some imagine the touch of stone or wood, metal or earth. They wish to feel the substance that is really there and let their hands pass over its pure form. And she says, even if you kind of know that in some ways, or you, the, the, the object might not meet your expectations, you still expect that your perception overall will be enhanced if you were able to handle it. 
And Langer's suggestion harks, harks back to remarks by Herder in the 18th century. So Herder holds that we use vision as a substitute for touch in our appreciation of sculpture. The eye is guided to seek out the information that the hand desires. And philosopher Rachel Zucker has written very effectively about this. Um, Herder also suggests that the beauty of three-dimensional forms and the pleasure they occasion actually belong to touch. The form is felt. Even if we've only looked at it and we've never touched it, he thinks the form is felt, perhaps imaginatively, rather than seen as beautiful. Now, I think there are several things happening here that are relevant for what I'm thinking about. First, the presence of sculpture affects the way I experience space to be organized. Second, I have imaginative bodily experiences of what it would be like to touch the sculpture. And as we know from more recent scientific findings, imaginative bodily experience experiences are really bodily. Like we have neurons that fire when we imagine bodily experience that are, so there are actual physiological, not just sort of mental or brain activities happening there, real neuronal activation. Third, I have longings associated with the sculpture. So the sculpture is entering my consciousness cognitively, imaginatively, emotionally, and somatically. Now Langer argues further that imagination has a profound role in shaping our perceptions of the world and in constituting our emotional lives. And so she's making this remark in a way that kind of goes beyond art, but it's highly relevant to how art serves us. She says, it's not just what we actually feel that constitutes our understanding of the world. She says it's sensation remembered and anticipated, not just what we're actually feeling right now, feared or sought, or even imagined and eschewed that is important in human life. It's perception molded by imagination that gives us the outward world, outward world we know. And it's the continuity of thought that systematizes our emotional reactions into attitudes with distinct feeling tones and sets a certain scope for an individual's passions. In other words, by virtue of our thought and imagination, we have not only feelings, not just kind of a flow of undefined sensations, but we actually have a life of feeling. So I suggest that these various insights brought together help to explain how the actual presence of certain materials, including their actual or potential states of decay, has distinctive expressive power. The sculptural object has real physical potential and thus offers real possibilities, which we feel as possibilities for us. Materials configured sculpturally reorganize our sense of possibility, spark imaginative bodily engagement, disturb us, and ignite our longings. So I want to think about Mark Quinn's self-portrait busts, an ongoing series that began in 1991. Quinn takes a direct cast of his own head, then he creates a mold that he fills with his own blood, and the work is completed through a process of freezing. And uh, I think this might be the very first one that he made in 91. He's done this every five years. Now, blood is a liquid in our neighborhood on this planet. And it has the natural tendencies of a liquid, which is to dissipate if it's uncontained, right? And these tendencies lend themselves adequately to drawing or inscription, you know, notes written in blood and stuff like that. They don't lend themselves quite as well to sculpture, generally speaking. Quinn's process kind of wryly mimics what we do with bronze, right? Rendering it temporarily liquid for casting, knowing that it'll go back to its highly durable solidity as it cools. Quinn instead uses the natural liquidity of blood and then suspends it in a solid state. So when we encounter this work, we know that this is wrong, right? I mean, we know it's not, blood's not supposed to be like this. The wrongness of it, the potential liquidity, which is also the possibility of a bloodbath, of the artist's head dissolving into a pool of blood, like this is present to us when we see these works. Our knowledge that the object is constituted of frozen blood makes it hum with the potential of disaster. And you can feel this even if you aren't aware that one of the works in this series was in fact destroyed um, when the power to the vitrine was lost. Even if you aren't thinking, as I have been lately, about the grisly failures of early attempts to cryogenically preserve human bodies for future revival, there was a guy who like promised to keep a bunch of people's like people's bodies frozen, and he kind of catastrophically it didn't quite work out. And just if you think about that, that's all I'm going to say. Let's not. Let's not. But still, I mean, this is this is kind of in that neighborhood of like. We'll, you know, we're going to save him forever. We're going to save this forever, right? We humans aren't that good at keeping things frozen. Even our icebergs are melting. Um, so also present to us is the object's current actual state. And this is a significantly later one. Um, the coldness, solidity, and ghastliness of this strangely shaped blood popsicle. And then there's our further contemplation of the blood itself. 
The large quantity of the artist's blood obviously would have been medically removed over a period of time. In fact, each of these takes about the entire volume of blood that's present in a human body at a given moment, right? So he has to have basically, in a sense, have an equivalent quantity of, the, of all the blood in the body removed to, to put in here. And um, blood thus removed is often used for therapeutic purposes, though not in this case. Blood gives life, but it's lost through injury and wound can result in death. Blood records what we've been up to, as Quinn, an alcoholic, um, would be acutely aware. Blood can prompt squeamishness and unease, and for good reason. Contact with others' blood can be dangerous, right? So, of course, by freezing the blood and putting it in a vitrine, Quinn confuses these reactions a little bit because the blood is safely contained from us for the moment. But I feel like there's a kind of duality to our encounter with this work. Even while it is present to us as a solid object, clinically frozen, its potential for decay and loss animates our emotions and our bodily imaginings. It matters that the work actually has the potential to melt, which we feel and experience as potential not only for it, but for us. So I'm just making grand psychological claims with no data, but um, <laughs> anyway, I'll <laughs> just be honest about my method. <laughs> um, now I want to turn to Kara Walker's um, 2014 work, which has this very long title, probably many of you saw it, um, A Subtlety or The Marvelous Sugar Baby, an homage to the unpaid and overworked artisans who have refined our sweet tastes from the cane fields to the kitchens of the new world on the occasion of the demolition of the Domino sugar refining plant. This work, like Quinn's, has a pronounced duality. It is, or was, simultaneously present to us as a magnificent monument and as an impending ruin. The fact that the building in which it was displayed was soon to be demolished is signaled in the title. And the grand sphinx figure is made with a surface of white sugar, which is soluble. And the object is described as a subtlety, which is traditionally a small sugar sculpture designed to be eaten. But most markedly, the child worker figures, some cast in brown sugar and others cast in resin and coated in molasses, were collapsing before our eyes. The visible disintegration, along with the associated smell, heightened the sense of ephemerality, of impending loss. And this activated all sorts of bodily, emotional, and imaginative responses. The most well-publicized reactions were dis disrespectful and exploitative, objectifying the black female bodies, body in ways that hark back to the sexual violence against black women that was used to produce a labor force to create wealth for whites during the sugar industry. And as Kara Walker sort of said about this work, she knew perfectly well that, you know, placing this kind of object in the world would generate these kinds of responses. But other forms of longing and bodily engagement were in play as well. Children were seen playing with and even licking the child laborer figures. Um, there's, a, a, there's a picture that I saw, I didn't have time to find it again, of, of a child, like there was a, one of the pools of syrup on the floor, a ch little child kind of delightedly you know, and with parents kind of, you know, urging the child on. Um, Walker had video shot of audience engagement with the work. And, and the video showed, interestingly, that some treated the Sphinx figure with gentle and reverent caresses. They were really sort of loving forms of touch. So while there were signs indicating that touching of the work is prohibited, the knowledge and visible signs of the work's degradation and eventual destruction may have helped to disable the prohibition on touching, even though it was advertised, and allow people to feel more fully justified in indulging their longings and in indulging a sort of being attracted to the work's physical allure. Why not appreciate um, engagement with the work fully? Why not touch it, given that there's no chance of the object's long-term preservation and that there would be no opportunity to return for future encounters um, in later years. Now, I want to acknowledge, like, people touch works all the time. So it's not like people, it's not like, generally speaking, people need a suspension of the prohibition. People do crazy stuff to artworks all the time. But, I, you know, the, the fact that the ephemerality was so clear and apparent and on display may have helped people to feel like, hey, you know, I'm not going to be damaged in something for posterity. My, the, you know, the oils of my finger aren't going to prevent somebody in 200 years from experiencing this. So... Um, maybe I can let myself um, connect with it. Most of us, of course, did not lick the objects or dip our hands into the syrupy goo puddled on the floor. But the signs of loss and disintegration nonetheless heighten our sensory imaginings of texture, viscosity, and sweetness. Our actual visual perception of the objects is, as Langer suggested, molded by the imagination, connecting to both embodied des desire and emotional passion. Now, a simulacrum, of course, also engages the imagination. 
but not in the same way as the potentialities that we know it to offer for us are different. If you think back to Ai Weiwei's 2010 work, Sunflower Seeds, um, this was displayed by placing 100 million individually hand-painted porcelain sunflower seeds in the, um, the turbine hall at the Tate Modern. And um, here's somebody who's actually painting some of those. Ceramic seeds function differently than real seeds in our experience because of their very different potentialities for us. Real sunflower seeds are edible, while ceramic seeds will not nourish, might break your teeth. So artists use unconventional materials expressively. And they set in motion states of disintegration and decay for expressive purposes. Goodman and Elgin give us some resources to account for this when they discuss exemplification, the process whereby a work can render salient some of its own characteristics, thereby signaling that we are to take them seriously. These characteristics, once highlighted, can then be deployed to metaphorical ends. This matters. You ask yourself, how does it matter? But to complete the explanation of why literal exemplification, the actual inclusion and salience of decaying materials, has expressive significance that differs from that of depiction or simulation, we have to look to further experiential phenomena. Sculptural materials have potential that we feel as potential for ourselves. We have embodied and emotional reactions to them, sometimes only felt and sometimes acted upon. Actual states of decay may alter our sense of the prohibitions associated with contact as they undermine the illusion of an untouchable object preserved for posterity. And our awareness of fragility, even in an object not yet exhibiting decay, <coughs> creates a duality in our experience with the object present to our senses, even as its deg degraded state lurks in our imaginations. The literal exemplification of decay in Leonard's Strange Fruit for David activates a powerful metaphorical exemplification of mortality. The literal exemplification of hollow shells that have been futilely stitched back together only to continue their process of disintegration metaphorically exemplifies emptiness, loss, and the persistence of grief. The activation of these metaphors is emotional and embodied. Our knowledge that Leonard and her friends actually ate all of this fruit and collected the peels over a period of years and that she painstakingly sewed them all back up again activates our embodied awareness of eating, handling, and acts of care. The decay of the objects constitutes real loss, not merely loss alluded to. We know and feel that we are encountering the transitory, the transitory genuinely present to us, genuinely exemplified. Thank you.